memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we trust them. Oh, may all who come behind us find us where we go.
you all stand? We're going to enter our prayer time, and we'd like to sing a chorus together called I Stand and All. We would join. Church of God. Larry and Vivian Voigt and a couple of their family members were on their way back home from Branson, Missouri. They were riding motorcycles. And Larry and Vivian were struck by a car. She was killed. He is in critical condition in a hospital in St. Louis. I called their son last night on his cell phone, who was with them at the time, who saw this take place. And I told Chuck Boyd, and I said, Chuck, we'll be praying for you this morning. You know, we don't understand it. But you see, God can turn that tragedy and make it into triumph. We don't know how, we don't know when, we don't know where. But God deserves all the glory. This morning, we trust that you like the Lord is coming. Let's bow our heads for a time of prayer this morning. Father in heaven again, we stand in awe of you this morning. Holy God, to whom all praises we stand in awe of you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for being our God, for watching over us, for creating us. Oh, 
by Arlen's and Ruth's home because I get more out of our visit than you probably do. And this week was no exception. I wanted to ask them a particular question. And the question was this. I asked them, what's the key to life? I mean, how have you been married or what's your secret for being married for 69 years? 69 years! <clears throat> well, Ruth didn't hesitate to respond. She batted her eyebrows at Arlen, took his hand and said, love. At that point, I thought I'd better excuse myself. <laughs> but I didn't. And then she went on to say, love for Jesus as well. And keeping your eyes fixed on Him. And if, if there's ever a charge I want to give to you as family and as church family this morning, I want to give you that charge. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out. Then he goes on and he says in verse 2, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. It includes the anger and the bitterness that perhaps still lingers. It includes the many times that we've tried to overcome maybe an addiction or a habit but have failed. Failures and hurts from the past. There's a story about a young man who became critically ill. And he had to go live with his mother, whom he despised greatly. He hated his mother. He was angry with his mother because he felt that in many ways she had ruined his life. But now he didn't have a choice. 
And so as he began to get ready to move into his mother's home, he began to pack various suitcases full of his clothing that he would need. In doing so, he also packed along with his clothes the many manuscripts that he had written throughout the years that told of his anger towards his mother. When he moved in with his mother, his mother greeted him with open arms. She loved him. She cared for him. Not knowing that just in the other room were these suitcases that contained these damaging, hurtful words. You see, his idea was that when he would pass away because of this illness, that she would stumble upon these suitcases and for sure find these manuscripts that contain these words. But in the time as she cared for him, he began to see a different side of his mother that he had never seen before. He began to see that there was some good in her. And so one morning, he got up as the sun came up. He took those suitcases underneath his hand and ventured outside to the nearest river. And he grabbed each suitcase full of the manuscripts and tossed them in the water. He watched as they floated away, taking his hatred and his anger with him. He was now a free man, free from the past. Perhaps that's what some of us need to do this morning. We need to throw our suitcases into the river of forgetfulness. This church is 90 years old this year. But you see, we're never going to move forward as a church. Or you're never going to move forward as what God has called you to be if you constantly look back at your failure spiritually or spiritually. You see, the problem with bad habits is that they enslave us. They become our master, the Bible says. Let's call it a B.A., a bad attitude. Oh, man. Those of you that aren't raising your hand, you're lying. Boy, it is so easy to get a bad attitude. I like what Charles Swindoll has to say about attitude. And I know I've mentioned it here in the past, but I like what Steve Carney said last week at our men's ox roast. He was about to tell a story and he says, now, if you've heard it before, that's okay because I want to hear it again. <laughs> and if you've heard this already, that's okay because I want to hear it again. <coughs> what Chuck Swindoll says about attitude. He says, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than success, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearances, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have. That is our attitude. 
I am convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitude. Here, Arlen suffered a stroke. Very devastating to him, to the family. I mean, here, Arlen and Ruth, you'd never been away from one another, right? No. Never been away. And that was rough for him. I'll be honest with you. He couldn't take it. I saw him at Genoa, nursing home. He was asleep. He didn't look very good. And I thought to myself, boy, I don't know if he's going to make it. We had prayer together. And the next thing I knew, the family was transporting him over to Riverview, nursing home over in Oak Harbor, Ohio. And I received a call from Merle one morning. And he said, Pastor, I'd appreciate it if you'd go and talk to my dad. He's really struggling right now. It's tough for him being away from his, his wife. He's always done things with his hands. He's always been busy at doing something. And now he feels useless. I'd appreciate it if you'd go and say something to him. I hung up the phone, and I'll be honest with you, I thought to myself, what am I going to say? I'm no counselor. I haven't been educated in that field. I said, Lord, you give me the words to say. And Arlen, I remember as if it were yesterday. When I walked into your room, and you were trying to eat your lunch, didn't care for some of the food. <laughs> you told me so. <laughs> but I remember you being honest with me saying, Pastor, I'm struggling right now. I don't even know if I want to live right now. We pray. We encouraged one another. We talked to the Lord and we said, Lord, you see Him here. Be with His attitude. Help Him to make a difference with those that He comes in contact with here. The Lord heard our prayer. And it wasn't just a few months later that you were on your way home to be back and join with your beautiful bride. Do you know what that story, what that spoke to me about? You're never too old to be attacked by Satan. Have you get a bad attitude to start questioning God and all of a sudden say, God, I don't want to live no more. Attitude. <coughs> the Bible tells us as Christians to encourage one another, to build up one another daily as we see the day of heaven drawing near. Remember, as the writer of the Hebrew says, we're surrounded by such a great a cloud of witnesses. You know what I think about when I think of that? I think that I'm in an Olympic stadium and I'm running a race. And I see those that have gone on in your family as well that have lived a good Christian life cheering us on in the stands and saying, you can make it, you can run the race. Encouraging. Run the race, family, friends, at your mom and dad, at your grandparents, have set before you to run. 
It's a race that is worthwhile winning. You see, heaven's our prize. But Father, even greater than that, we're so thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, who you sent to die for us on a cross, who loves us and cares about us. And Father, I just ask, Lord, that if there's anyone here that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that today be the day. And Father, they'll want to know you as Lord and Savior. And they've been trying to live life on their own and that's just not making it for them. It's been a dead end street. Father, you have so much more for us. Thank you again for allowing us to be in your presence. In your Son's name we ask. Amen. Turn in your hymnals to 527. 527.
favorite was potato soup, if there was any doubt. I remember when I went to college asking for the recipe and being just surprised to learn there wasn't one. Making soup I learned is more of an organic soup experience. <laughs> Some water from the boiling potatoes is important, unless of course you wanted mashed potatoes. Another favorite was stuffed green peppers, and I did get the recipe for that one. My grandma was also a teacher. And she believed that learning could be fun. We learned through playing games like Racco, Scrabble, and Yahtzee. She taught us how to lose. <laughs> we marveled at Grandpa's invention, the trolley that made us go round in the siphon between the ponds. Even the lights on the cross in the church that operate in parallel so they don't burn out and these hands off. We delighted in Grandma's pantry full of preserves and jams and of course her bottomless cookie jar and her ability to take a stain out of clothing throughout the year of household products was unsurpassed. <laughs> but the most powerful lesson learned from Grandma and Grandma through our childhood with Yan well Yan has been the last time. Living simply through sickness and in health, in good times as well as hard. All the while we came up. This is 
Earl Hilly. You can even see the scar here today. This is like 72 years ago. <laughs> That's not like yesterday. Yeah. Anyway, a young lady came to my rescue and she taped my hand up. And I'm almost sure that was Ruth and Arlen. Do you remember that? No. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure that was you because I can still remember you taped my hand up so I could go back out skating again. <laughs> anyway, uh, that was quite an experience. And I saw so much about the ponds and here's so much about the ponds. And I was one of these guys that had, had a lot of fun at the pond. You probably don't even remember that. <laughs> I'd like to say 70 some years ago. At least 72. Anyone else? Who's next? It's weird eating habits. He would eat anything on his plate down to the juice of the green beans or peas or whatever. And most of you younger people in here have heard of the 10 second rule. Drop it on the floor, you got 10 seconds to pick it up, blow it off and eat it. So one time we're out at the farmhouse, we're all in the kitchen eating cookies. I drop my cookie on the floor. Grandpa picks it up, rinses it off, and then eats it. And I was like, why did you rinse off the soap? <laughs> and uh, I, even as a child, I remember marveling because, well, there weren't six kids when I was a kid. <laughs> it was basically rural, his little brother Niall, who was very creatively uh, obnoxious <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Who's playing hockey and when he kicked the, the puck without a stick, you see, he was just helping him out. After that, but people gave him a helmet. It's still in the basement. I reached out with my foot, left foot, with my right foot, and I reached out to kick, kick the stop of rolling, rolling buck, and that was the last thing I remember. <laughs> I spent every summer uh, at Harlan and Roos, and I remember uh, three things that it were that a lot of fun. First of all, we all would, all of us would spend with other cousins up in the upstairs. We went to had eight or nine, telling uh, the scary stories as we could. We always wanted to sleep in Merle's room because Merle liked to explain the universe. He was very fascinated, and Merle would talk with this real soft voice like this. We'd go right to sleep. <laughs> yes, the stars. We still do go right to sleep. No, I do. <laughs> he could be a preacher, right? <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not. The other thing I remember was uh, we'd go to sleep and every morning uh, we'd have to get up because Arlen would have our, our work cut out for us and we would go to the garden or dig a hole or whatever we're going to do. But he would always pay us. And I think we got either a penny or a nickel or something per quart of strawberries. And then we'd go in the strawberry patch. You wouldn't pay us by the hour because we would never work if it was by the hour. You paid us by the quart. You all respond or something. And get a few mosquito bites back there. You remember those days? So Arlen was the one that taught me how to work, you know? Ruth was the one that always could listen. You know, you'd have your, your cuts on your legs and your stubbed toes. And Aunt Ruth would always be the one who brought the comfort. Thank you all, and I congratulate you on being able to live together for uh, 69 years and never even once being upset with each other, right? <laughs> Are you going to write a book about that? Cookie, and every time they came, she had a cookie jar full of their favorite kind of cookies. Uh, 21, 22 grandchildren she has, and she knew what kind of cookie each and every one of them wanted, and she would make up a whole big batch of cookies. I think besides Dave getting married, he had quite a wet, quiet wedding before he moved to Pittsburgh, but other than that, I think I was the first grandchild that got married, and uh, my husband was in the Navy, and we moved down to Virginia Beach for a year until he got out of the Navy. And I was lonely and bored and made a lot of phone calls and wrote a lot of letters, and I remember I got a letter from Grandpa one day, which was surprising to me to get a letter from my Grandpa, so I ripped it open and I read it. And uh, Grandpa congratulated me on my marriage, and he was thrilled at our, our wedding and just loved having Neil and the family, and went on to say how anxious they were for some great-grandchildren and when was I going to get busy. <laughs> <laughs> so I did give him the first great-grandchild, Christine, is around here somewhere. Oh, really? Back there. Dr. <laughs> Stan, uh, every summer, Sometimes in between, but mostly every summer, it was on our schedule to come to see Grandma and Grandpa and to visit all of our cousins, Elaine and of course Merle's, and every relative around the area. Uh, I just remember uh, as a child that this was so important in my spiritual development, and there was just kind of a, a heritage. I know that I heard. I'll speak of it many times. I feel the same way. It was a just. I told my husband kind of when I was coming here this weekend. I felt like I was kind of coming home. Not just because when I look at our Uncle Arlen, I see my daddy, but because uh, this is where I just really grew spiritually. I can remember uh, some Wednesday night in that church. Maybe it was even the old church. I'm not sure. But sitting there, hot, very hot. <laughs> Everybody fanning singing every verse of Rescue the Perishing. <laughs> it seemed awfully long, but when I look back at things that made me who I am today, and my children, that's because of my heritage. Uh, it was the Christian, solid Christian heritage that I got. Elmore is a huge part of it, and you are a huge part of it. 
too. I want to go and get the funny little thing. You mentioned about you have six kids. You know, and I, somehow I came into a, a, a little copy of a letter that my dad sent from Africa to you. And I don't know how I got that. If I, You probably want that. So I have it. And he is talking to Uncle Arnold in it. And uh, he got to get down to the bottom. He says, oh, by the way, I hear that you're expecting it in. Hey, 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 isn't that sick? I need to talk to you when I get home. <laughs> do it. And didn't you have chickens? Do you have chickens at your house? Yeah. You had you had chickens. I don't know if you had the eggs. Who had chickens, Mama? Okay, Mother had the chicken with the eggs that I helped gather, but you, I remember, Ruth, that you got in a fight with a chicken, and I did not know how you, I thought that you always go to the store and get your chicken for fried chicken, and I saw a chicken that looked like he had attacked her, and she was fighting him, and she won because she pulled his head off. <laughs> what did he do to her? And she put him in the frying pan and cooked him for us. And then the other thing I remember is, is uh, the frog choir that my dad led, and, and you and my dad, Uncle Elmer. Yeah, I was in recruiting on the tape recorder while he was up in the pond, transmitting with the microphone. Yes, I think it was on national television. You recorded it. <laughs> frog choir and dad actually coached the frogs. I don't know how he had frog intelligence in his brain that he coached them. Okay frogs, ready? One, two, three. And just like clockwork. And it was like thousands of frogs in the in the pond and then he would tell them, okay, stop now. And they would stop. And he'd do it over and over again. I don't know how, how that works. But what a pleasure it's been to be a part of the legacy of the family video this morning and this video those are a legacy to our Kardatsky family history and I just thank you so much for providing that in our family. Yeah. Christian home too, and it was wonderful to, to see Niles' family and, and such a solid Christian uh, home. But the, one of the things that I admired about uh, both Ruth and Harlan is their uh, ability to really uh, enjoy life and to just take time to enjoy things, um, just simple things. Um, my, my parents were had a very strong work, work ethic, and uh, there was a lot of work involved, especially from my mother's standpoint. She she worked all the time, you know, around the house. And everything was was um, had to be just so. But and I saw Ruth just decide that it was time to put on some music, so that while she was working around the house, she could enjoy the music while she worked. Or when she came in from teaching school, uh, she'd put the potatoes on to cook for supper, but then she would go take a nap and take care of herself. And, of course, Grandpa um, always took time for just fun stuff, playing games, uh, building fun things in the yard, and so um, I think it's such a rich heritage of, uh, one, knowing how to, to uh, take care of yourself, be kind to yourself, and also to really take time for the important enjoyment of life and know what, what those moments are and enjoy them as you go along. There's something about the relationships between mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws that I want to comment on. And Grandma Kurdetsky was a, a wonderful mother-in-law to Ruth when she came to live in Ohio here. And uh, there's just a lot of things, including coming to, to help out when the babies were born. Well, the day I was born, the the uh, leader of Rain, Wainwright got sick by eating green apples. And, uh, so Grandma had to come 
and help out. But before the day was over, Joe Forrest, uh, Ellen's dad, came over and said, Mom, you've got to come and help us because Eula's having a baby. <laughs> so Dick and I became twins. <laughs> uh, twin cousins, that is. And, uh, but the relationship between my grandmother and my mother was something that was an inspiration to me over the years, and I think to a lot of other people, because she had a, an easy way of being a, a step, a um, mother-in-law to to her her daughters-in-law, and and that's a, an interesting relationship. Um, as a new person, the first one to come into our family, my wife, she she refuses to tell these stories, but she uh, asked my dad, you know, are you going to call him? She, you know, she thinks, you know, should she call him Arlen? Should she call him Daddy? And so she asked, what should I call you? And he said, Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs>
Christmas time, Anna and I would lay in that bed and be real quiet when we when we finally settled down. Real quiet. Sometimes put our ear right up to the side of the chimney to see if we could hear when Santa Claus came down the chimney. We did. We usually fell asleep that way, so we don't know if he ever came down or not. Okay. Mom. Okay. Wow, look at those muscles. Happy face. Look at those muscles. We were helping. Greg, get a Greg. 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 some things out of the van. These are the cars of the first arrivals. And we're here at the Mid-America Bible College. It's a very attractive campus. We're going to go on inside. 